Facebook. And I'm just going to read it to you. Which is, this is from Cody. Which is more important, the battle against cultural Marxism or the battle against presuppositionalism? Well, one is an effect and the other is a cause. Cultural Marxism is an immediate threat to my life. But presuppositionalism is a greater and wider threat long term. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not changing it. I'm reading it directly. I agree with the well-known presuppositionalist Jeff Durbin. Jeff Durbin is now that young kid that showed up out there <laughs> is now a well-known presuppositionalist. Congratulations, Jeff. You just need a little more of this white stuff and you're going to be... That'll really help with the credibility. It really will. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with the well-known presuppositionalist Jeff Durbin that there is a way to argue for God that is immoral. We just, agree, we just disagree about which method is the immoral one. So he's saying that to argue for the existence of God as a presuppositionalist is immoral. And it's worse than cultural Marxism. I see presuppositionalism in professors and pastors as running interference for a growing trend of fideism in congregants. It dulls our swords, diminishing our ability to fight the external battles or to keep young souls in the church. Now, so, so the young people that are going into the, in the universities and losing their faith is because of presuppositionalism in the church? I'm sorry, Cody, you do not have near enough life experience to even get close to making that comment. Um, 99%, 99% of those individuals were not in Reformed churches where presuppositionalism was being taught. Okay? 99%. Um, the rupture of young people is primarily from what we would call evangelifish um, uh, churches, where they've been entertained in in children's church and then young people's church. They've got basically no doctrinal foundation. They've never been challenged. They've just been entertained all the way through. And now all of a sudden they're thrown to the wolves and they have no foundation, no meaningful Christian worldview of any kind whatsoever. To blame that on presuppositionalism, I'm sorry, is just fantastically absurd. I mean, this is imbalanced on a really big scale. I mean, you're way too close to this. You're, you're, you're looking at the bark of a tree and you're missing the forest, man. I mean, this is not even close to balance. Not even, and I ain't the only one that's ever told you this. I happen to know that. Um, I know many young people have left the church, and I can't say they were given a compelling picture of what faith is or why it makes sense. Yeah, but that you have a thousand times greater opportunity to have been given a meaningful presentation of the Christian worldview in a Reformed church than in a non-Reformed church. And amongst the Reformed people is where you're going to find presuppositionalism. It is, it is an inconsistent system in a non-Reformed. I know they're non-Reformed presuppositionalists, but I don't get how that works. Because presuppositionalism, when you ask the question, what am I to defend? It is defending the Reformed gospel. The fullness of that gospel. Sovereignty of God. Deadness of man and sin. All the rest of that stuff. Um, that's not what's being taught in the vast majority of these churches. These people are leaving. Too many churches are atheist factories. That is why I'm zealous against presuppositionalism. The stakes of the battle are high. Our camp is not in order. Well, that... So I saw this, and I, I posted it on Facebook, and I said, What? 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 And what's interesting is... Um, on Thursday, my plan is to do the Radio Free Geneva, and it's going to have to be a long one, or, well, I'm not sure how long it's going to last, but 
um, respond to Mike Winger's um, video that has, has been sent to me 47,000 times. And people keep saying, I want to hear what you say, but it's, it's like, oh, stop. I, I've already said I'm going to be dealing with this. I saw it. Um, I'm sorry, it's not difficult to deal with. And if you're reformed and you don't see what the problem is, I'm concerned that maybe you, you've you embraced a system you don't understand or, or something. I'll, I'll just be straight up with you on that because it's pretty obvious where the, where the problem is in the argumentation. It's not super strong argumentation. There's a basic error right at the beginning. It's repeated over and over again. Uh, don't even have to play the whole thing because it's just repeated over and over and over again. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that on, on, on Thursday. So I had said, you know, I need to listen to the video. And so on, uh, Saturday I put that and then I, people had said, Hey, did you hear he had a conversation with Cy Ten Bruggenkate? And so I found it, converted it and put that on my iPod as well. And I went for a really long ride. So I had plenty of time to listen to both of them and found the presuppositional discussion actually more interesting than the other one that I'll actually be addressing. And so I was already thinking along these lines because listening to he and Sai going back and forth on presuppositionalism, he had made some comments on Romans one that I was like, I think maybe I'll include this too in the radio free Geneva, because this is a really important issue. Um, and so we'll, we'll tie that together. Well, then at the same time, all this other stuff comes out and I see all the, you know, all these people starting to make comments about presuppositionalism in Twitter and stuff. And they have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, none. Now, look, let me just say off the top. I realize there are different flavors of presuppositionalism. If you read K. Scott Oliphant, you've got covenantal apologetics, um, different terminology that's used. Uh, you know, you've got Van Til, and then you've got Van Til and Clark going at it, and and then you've got their interpreters everywhere from from Greg Bonson, um, a, a bunch of people. I've I've talked to a bunch of people over my lifetime who sort of feel like they've got the inside track on the interpretation of what Van Til really meant, because Van Til's original language was in English and his English writing isn't all that great. And most of us aren't going to be reading it in Dutch or whatever it was anyway. Um, and so I'm well aware of the fact that you cannot simply go, well, this is presuppositionalism and I get to define it. Um, there are going to be differing emphases, um, given the individuals to whom you're speaking, just as there are all sorts of, you know, it's like listening to classical versus evidential and all the rest of this type of stuff. And there are dividing lines, however, and that's what I think people are missing or what the real dividing lines are. And once you lay them out, I think it provides clarity. Now, my understanding is that the, uh, the guys at Choosing Hats has already had a uh, dialogue with these young guys, and that'll be coming out. So that'll that'll be useful. And I would direct people to other people other than myself for a number of different reasons, one of which I'm going away for three weeks. Um, but the most serious reason is I've taught Christian philosophy religion many, many times on the graduate level, but... I'm a presuppositionalist, not because of some philosophical framework that I've developed. Um, I'm a biblical Trinitarian, and I'm a biblical presuppositionalist. Um, biblical exegesis is where I think it's at. I think for the people of God, you open the Word of God, I've seen it change people. And um, the, the teaching that has the longest lasting effect, I would believe, would be Declaring the whole counsel of God. Apologetically, here's the second reason why um, the common mechanism of apologetics doesn't work. How about you and I? You know, let's just uh, let's just lay aside our swords here. Let's you know, I won't assume anything, and 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 you don't assume anything. Let's just 
step down here on this neutral ground and let's just reason with one another. I already pointed out, you're dealing with someone who has a darkened mind. You're dealing with someone who is in rebellion against God. They are actively suppressing the knowledge of God. And what's going to change that? They can't choose to change that. God has to change that. Something called regeneration has to take place. If you want to start talking about prevenient grace and all the rest of this stuff, this is something that Pastor Winger did, start, you know, prevenient grace, all the rest of this stuff. I ain't in the Bible no place. It just isn't there. You can, you can try to stick it in there. It ain't there. Um, that's the first problem. But here's the second problem. And it's a much more basic problem. There ain't no neutral ground to stand on. Where are you going to stand? If Colossians chapter 1 is true, verses 16 and 17, all things created by him before him. He is before all things. In him all things sunestic and hold together. Heaven and earth, visible, invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, authorities, all things created by him before him. He's before all things. If that's true, where are you going to find this uh, neutral ground? Because if it's ground to stand on, guess who made it? Jesus did. Guess who defines it? Jesus does. Oh, that's so radical. I mean, I'll never get a PhD. At a, at a secular university, if I say that, yeah, man, true. But tell me where I'm wrong. Show me where I'm wrong. If Jesus is the one described in Colossians 1 and John 1 and Hebrews 1, it's not just Colossians 1, we could have gone to any one of them. If he is the one who created all things, then... Tell me how you can have a neutral ground with an unbeliever. Because any ground you're going to stand on is defined by Jesus. Any fact that is a fact is made a fact and defined as a fact by Christ. So, I would have to lie to the unbeliever. I'd have to pretend that that neutral ground was neutral ground because from a Christian worldview, there is no neutral ground. And here's the problem. You may get away with it. You may get away with it. And, but here's, here's the issue. Somewhere down the road, let's say you get them to start believing what you're having to say. And you're, you're, you're doing the, the, you know, the incrementalism. You're slowly getting them to do this and this and this and this and eventually you get down to teaching them about what the Bible teaches about this Jesus that you're calling them to follow, and they read Colossians 1. And they look at you, and they go, wait a minute. All things? Didn't you tell me just a few months ago, when we first started, that you're going to lay aside all your assumptions and stuff like that, and, and we were just going to but if Jesus created all things, you couldn't have done that. You were lying to me. Well, hey, you know, it's for your own good. I can't do that. I hope you can't do that. I know there are people who will do that. But I don't see how that's honoring to God. I don't want to have to tell somebody. Months down the road, yeah, you know, I sort of got you into this on the sly, but hey, you know, we're great folks, and you've already, you know, committed so much to this, you know, don't let it bother, bother you, right? Yeah. I don't want to do that. I hope you don't want to do that. There is no morally neutral ground. There is no epistemologically neutral ground, because God, in Jesus Christ, made all things. Biblical foundation. Biblical foundation for why I believe very firmly that it is necessary and appropriate to have as your starting place the revelation of God, the reality of His sovereignty, an understanding of His gospel, and that as you present your case the Christian faith, that you never invite 
the sinner to climb up upon the throne and judge the existence of God. God will judge you. You will never judge God. I've told the story before. I'll wrap up with it. Years ago, I was invited to give a little talk at a university in Chicago. November, December, it was cold. And when I get there, I find out that what the campus group has done, I thought I was going to be talking to Christians, what the campus group has done is they've passed out flyers that say, stump the chump. Are you an atheist? Do you like to argue about God? Free pizza. <laughs> and so right at the time we're supposed to start, this guy walks in. And this is an illustration of how things, how your memory fades over the years. Either he had red hair and was wearing all blue, or he had blue hair and was wearing all red. Don't remember which one it was. I think it was the blue hair and all red. I, If I was going to bet on one of the two. But I need an FBI investigation to find out. Anyway, um, this guy sits on the second row. And so I do, you know, it's a college thing. So I do 10, 12 minutes. Only going to be able to go so long before the questions start. And, and uh, he says, uh, he starts in. And uh, he, he's a sophomore philosophy student. I think the term sophomore is a wonderful term. It really is. It's from sophos and moronos. It's, <laughs> it's a wise fool. The sophomore thinks he's got it all figured out. Now he's got freshmen below him, so he knows more than them, so he's got it all figured out. Oh, he had it all figured out. And he was one of these skeptics. So he was skeptical. Of he was skeptical of his own existence. Really was. He was skeptical of his own existence. And... He had worn this brown leather jacket, real thick one, because Chicago, it's cold. You don't have a thick leather jacket, the wind's going to slice right through you. And uh, at one point, he had made a comment about not even knowing, for example, that his jacket exists. Can't even prove the existence of that. How can you prove the existence of God? Well... We went back and forth for a little while. We, we broke to have the pizza because the pizza was going to get cold. And nobody cared what we were arguing about at that point anyways. They just wanted to eat the pizza. So he and I continue talking. I was hungry. Someone brought me some pizza. I never got to eat a bite of it. I do remember that very clearly. But we talked for a long time. And I didn't say a whole lot. What I was doing is I was just sort of letting him talk. Waiting. Listening carefully. And eventually he says something along the lines of, I know I should know, I know I should do better. And that's when I knew I had him. If I recall correctly, Algo could tell me. Um, Algo is in channel, but I don't know if he's uh, active. But I believe his name was Eric, because Algo has heard this story probably about 20 times. And I'm pretty sure his name was, uh, was Eric. And... Um, I said, Algo, I said, um, Algo, Eric, yeah, Algo, yeah, uh, Eric, you're a thief. He's like, what? I said, you're borrowing from my God to hold your world together. You don't believe in him, you don't worship him, but you steal from his truth and his world to hold yours together. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, you just said you needed to do better, but you've not given me any reason to believe that you have any basis for thinking what better is. You are living in God's world. You're not living in the world you made. And I'll give you an illustration. Your jacket's there on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the chair, and you said you couldn't even prove it exists, but I'm going to guarantee you something. When you leave tonight, and it's about 20 degrees and windy outside, when you leave tonight, 
you are going to take your jacket with you because you know that in the real world, it's cold outside. You can claim all the agnosticism you want, but you know that you need that jacket. That little shirt you're wearing ain't going to be enough. You're going to take that jacket with you. And you know that once you go outside, uh, you're not going to walk down the middle of the road because a truck could run you over. And you know that there's certain laws of physics. It means if you get impacted at the front end of a truck, you're going to die. And so you're going to walk on the sidewalk. And you're going to act in such a way that you recognize that you live in God's world and then pretend that you don't. And he just looked at me like, he even said to me, no one's ever talked to me like that before. And I said, I'm sorry we didn't. We should have done it earlier. I said, here's my prayer for you. I said, every time you steal from my God's world and my God's truth, I pray he will convict you that, he, that you have done so. Now, I don't know what happened to Eric. Most people who suffer through that incredibly arrogant period in college survive and become better people later on, I hope. I don't know what happened to Eric. But I never want Eric to be able to say, I remember that guy that came and he invited me to judge whether God existed or not. No. He'd have to say, I remember that guy that came and man, he hit me upside the head and told me God's going to judge me and I don't get to judge God. Yeah. I don't remember if we discussed, I don't think we got around to discussing the transcendental argument for the existence of God, the classical presuppositional argument, the, the impossibility, the contrary, or any of those other things. The key was he walked away knowing that there was a Christian that had just told him something that he had to think about. And every time he did anything consistent with God's world, if he was still thinking about it, if God was bringing conviction to his heart and mind, he was getting convicted right, left, and center all the time. And if I had just given him a bunch of philosophical mumbo-jumbo, he could have dismissed that before he was done with his pizza that night. Which one do you think lasted? Which one do you want to give to someone when you're praying that the Holy Spirit of God will work in their lives? 